Most people think crystal gazing is all about magic and superstition. But what if I told you it's more about focused energy and mental clarity than mystical powers? In this lesson, we're breaking the illusion and diving into the real secrets behind clairvoyant crystal gazing. No incantations needed. Lesson 7. Clairvoyant Crystal Gazing As I have informed you in the preceding lesson, crystal gazing is the second method of getting in report with the astral plane. Under the general term crystal gazing I include the entire body of phenomena connected with the use of the use of the crystal, magic mirror, etc., the underlying principle being the same in all of such cases. The crystal, etc., serves to focus the psychic energy of the person in such a way that the astral senses are induced to function more readily than ordinarily. The student is cautioned against regarding the crystal, or magic mirror, as possessing any particular magic power in itself. On the contrary, the crystal, or magic mirror serves merely as a physical instrument for the astral vision, just as the telescope or microscope performs a similar office for the physical vision. Some persons are superstitious regarding the crystal, and accord to it some weird supernatural power, but the true occultist, understanding the laws of the phenomena arising from its use, does not fall into this error. But notwithstanding what I have just said, I would be neglecting my full duty in the matter if I failed to call your attention to the fact that the continued use of a particular crystal often has the effect of polarizing its molecules so as to render it a far more efficient instrument as time passes by. The longer the crystal is used by one person, the better does it seem to serve the uses of that person. I agree with many users of the crystal in their belief that each person should keep his crystal for his own personal use and not allow it to be used indiscriminately by strangers or persons not in his sympathy with occult thought. The crystal tends to become polarized according to the requirements of the person habitually using it, and it is foolish to allow this to be interfered with. The use of crystals and other bright, shining objects has been common to psychic investigators of all times and in practically all lands. In the earlier days of the race, pieces of clear quartz or shining pebbles were generally employed. Sometimes pieces of polished metal were so used. In fact, nearly every object capable of being polished has been employed in this way at some time, by some person. In our own day, the same condition exists. In Australia, the native soothsayers and magicians employ water and other shining objects, and in some cases even bright flames, sparks, or glowing embers. In New Zealand, the natives frequently employ drops of blood held in the hollow of the hand. The Fijians fill a hole with water and gaze into it. South American tribes use the polished surface of black or dark colored stones. The American Indians use water or shining pieces or flint or quartz. Shining pieces of metal are frequently used by the primitive races. Lang, writing on the subject, has said they stare into a crystal ball, a cup of mirror, a blot of ink, Egypt and India, a drop of blood, the Maris of New Zealand, a bowl of water, American Indians upon Roman and Exation, a mochen, an African water in a glass bowl, fez or almost any polished surface, etc. In the present-day revival of interest in crystal gazing among the wealthier classes of Europe and America, some of the high-priced teachers have insisted upon their pupils purchasing pure crystal globes, claiming that these alone are capable of serving the purpose fully. But, as such crystals are very expensive, this advice has prevented many from experimenting. But the advice is erroneous, for any globe of clear quartz, or even molded glass, will serve the purpose equally well, and there is no need of spending $25 to $50 for a pure crystal globe. For that matter, you may obtain very good results from the use of a watch crystal laid over a piece of black velvet. Some, today, use with the best effect small polished pieces of silver or other bright metal. Others follow the old plan of using a large drop of ink, poured into a small butter plate. Some have small cups painted black on the inside into which they pour water and obtain excellent results therefrom. Above all, I caution the student to pay no attention to instructions regarding the necessity of performing incantations or ceremonies over the crystal or other object employed as in crystal still gazing. This is but a bit of idle superstition and serves no useful purpose except, possibly, that of giving the person confidence in the thing. All ceremonies of this kind have for their purpose merely the holding of the attention of the person investigating and giving him confidence in the result, the latter having a decided psychological value, of course. There are but few general directions necessary for the person wishing to experiment in crystal gazing. The principal thing is to maintain quiet and an earnest, serious state of mind. Do not make a merry game of it, if you wish to obtain results. Again, always have the light behind your back instead of facing you. Gaze calmly at the crystal, but do not strain your eyes. I do not try to avoid winking your eyes. There is a difference between gazing and staring, remember. Some good authorities advise making funnels of the hands and using them as you would a pair of opera glasses. In many cases, a number of trials are required before you will be able to get good results. In others, at least some results are obtained at the first trial. It is a good plan to try to bring into vision something that you have already seen with the physical eyes, 
some familiar object. The first sign of actual psychic seeing in the crystal usually appears as a cloudy appearance or milky mist, the crystal gradually losing its transparency. In this milky cloud then gradually appears a form or face or scene of some kind more or less plainly defined. If you have ever developed a photographic film or plate, you will know how the picture gradually comes into view. W.T. Stead, the eminent English investigator of psychic phenomena, has written as follows regarding the phenomena of crystal gazing. There are some persons who cannot look into an ordinary globular bottle without seeing pictures form themselves without any effort or will on their part. In the crystal globe, crystal gazing seems to be the least dangerous and most simple of all forms of experimenting. You simply look into a crystal globe the size of a five shilling piece or a water bottle which is full of clear water and which is placed so that too much light does not fall upon it and then simply look at it. You make no incantations and engage in no mumbo jumbo business. You simply look at it for two or three minutes, taking care not to tire yourself, winking, but fixing your thought upon whatever you wish to see. Then, if you have the faculty, the glass will cloud over with a milky mist, and in the center the image is gradually precipitated in just the same way as a photograph forms on the sensitive plate. The same authority relates the following interesting experiment with the crystal Miss X, upon looking into the crystal on two occasions as a test, to see if she could see me when she was several miles off, saw not me, but a different friend of mine on each occasion. She had never seen either of my friends before, but immediately identified them both on seeing them afterward at my office. On one of the evenings on which we experimented in the vain attempts to photograph a double, I dined with Madame C. and her friend at a neighboring restaurant. As she glanced at the water bottle, Madame C. saw a picture beginning to form, and looking at it from curiosity, described with considerable detail an elderly gentleman whom she had never seen before, and whom I did not in the least recognize from her description at the moment. Three hours afterward, when the seance was over, Madame C. entered the room and recognized Mr. Elliot of Messrs. Elliot Fry, as the gentleman whom she had seen and described in the water bottle at the restaurant. On another occasion the picture was less agreeable, it was an old man lying dead in bed with someone weeping at his feet, but who it was, or what it related to, no one knew. Andrew Lang, another prominent investigator of psychic phenomena, gives the following interesting experiment in crystal gazing I had given a glass ball to a young lady, Miss Bailey, who had scarcely any success with it. She lent it to Miss Leslie, which she knit to old-fashioned red sofa covered with muslin which she afterward found in the next country house she visited. Miss Bailey's brother, a young athlete, laughed at these experiments, took the ball into his study, and came back looking gay gash, he admitted that Kumishi, somebody he knew, under a lamp. He said that he would discover during the week whether or not he had seen right. This was at 5.30 on a Sunday afternoon. On Tuesday, Mr. Bailey was at a dance in a town forty miles from his home and met a Miss Preston. On Sunday, he said, about half past five, you were sitting under a standard lamp, in a dress I never saw you wear, a blue blouse with lace over the shoulders, pouring out tea for a man in blue serge, whose back was toward me, so that I only saw the tip of his mustache. Why, the blinds must have been up, said Miss Preston. I was at Dolby, said Mr. Bailey, and he undeniably was. Miss X, the well-known contributor to the English magazine, Borderland several years ago, made a somewhat extended inquiry into the phenomena of crystal gazing. From her experiments, she made the following classification of the phenomena of crystal vision, which I herewith reproduce for your benefit. Her classification is as follows. 1. Images of something unconsciously observed. New reproductions voluntary or spontaneous and bringing no fresh knowledge to the mind. 2. Images of ideas unconsciously acquired from others. Some memory or imaginative effect, which does not come from the gazer's ordinary self. Revivals of memory. Illustrations of thought. 3. Images, clairvoyant or prophetic. Pictures giving information as to something past, present, or future, which the gazer has no other chance of knowing. As a matter of fact, each and every form or phase of clairvoyance possible under other methods of inducing clairvoyant vision is possible in crystal gazing. It is a mistake to consider crystal gazing as a separate and distinct form of psychic phenomena. Crystal gazing is merely one particular form or method of inducing psychic or clairvoyant vision. If you will keep this in mind, you will avoid many common errors and misunderstandings in the matter. In order to give you the benefit of as many points of view as possible, I shall now quote from an old English writer on the subject of the use of the writer. I do this realizing that sometimes a particular student will get more from one point of view than from another, some particular phrasing will seem to reach his understanding where others fail. The directions of the English authority are as follows. What is desired through the regular use of the translucent sphere is to cultivate a personal degree of clairvoyant power so that visions of things or events, past, present, and future, may appear clearly to the interior vision, or eye of the soul. 
In the pursuit of this effort only, the crystal becomes at once both a beautiful, interesting, and harmless channel of pleasure and instruction, shorn of dangers, and rendered conducive to mental development. To the attainment of this desirable end, attention is asked to the following practical directions, which, if carefully followed, will lead to success. 1. Select a quiet room where you will be entirely undisturbed, taking care that it is as far as possible free from mirrors, ornaments, pictures, glaring colors, and the like, which may otherwise district the attention. The room should be of comfortable temperature, in accordance with the time of year, neither hot nor cold. About 60 to 65 deg. Fahrenheit is suitable in most cases, though allowance can be made where necessary for natural differences in the temperaments and the temperaments of various persons. Thus thin, nervous, delicately organized individuals, and those of lymphatic and soft, easygoing, passive types require a slightly warmer apartment than the more positive class who are known by their dark eyes, hair and complexion, combined with prominent joints. Should a fire or any form of artificial light be necessary, it should be well screened off so as to prevent the light rays from being reflected in, or in any manner directly reaching the crystal. The room should not be dark, but s. 2. The crystal should be placed on its stand on a table, or it may rest on a black velvet cushion, but in either case it should be partially surrounded by a black silk or similar wrap or screen, so adjusted as to cut off any undesirable reflection. Before beginning to experiment, remember that most frequently nothing will be seen on the first occasion, and possibly not for several sittings though some sitters, if strongly gifted with psychic powers in a state of powers, and state and state of unconscious, and sometimes conscious degree of unfoldment, may be fortunate enough to obtain good results at the very first trial. If, therefore, nothing is perceived during the first few attempts, do not despair or become impatient or imagine that you will never see anything. There is a royal road to crystal vision, but it is open only to the combined password of calmness, patience, and perseverance. If at the first attempt to ride a bicycle, failure ensues, the only way to learn is to pay attention to the necessary rules and to persevere daily until the ability to ride comes naturally. Thus it is with the would-be seer. Persevere in accordance with these simple directions, and success will sooner or later or later crown your efforts. Three comments by sitting comfortably with the eyes fixed upon the crystal, not by a fierce stare, but with a steady, calm gaze, for ten minutes only, on the first occasion. In taking the time it is best to hang your watch at a distance. The ticking is rendered inaudible. When the time is up, carefully put the crystal away in its case, and keep it in a dark place, under lock and key, allowing no one but yourself to handle it. At the second sitting, which should be at the same place, in the same position, and it's a pain position and at the same time, you may increase the length of the effort to fifteen minutes, and continue for this period during the next five or six sittings, after which the time may be gradually increased, but should in no case exceed one hour. The precise order of repetition is always to be followed until the experimenter has developed an almost automatic ability to readily obtain results when it needs no longer to be adhered to. For any person or persons admitted to the room and allowed to remain while you sit should a keep absolute silence and B. Remain seated at a distance from you. When you have developed your latent powers, questions may, of course, be put to you by one of those present, but even then in a very gentle or low and slow tone of voice, never suddenly, or in a forceful manner. 5. When you find the crystal begins to look dull or cloudy, with small pinpoints of light glittering therein like tiny stars, you may know that you are commencing to obtain that for which you seek, vitalis at crystalline vision. Therefore persevere with confidence. This condition may, or may not, continue for several sittings, the crystal seeming at times to alternately appear and disappear, as in a mist. By and by this hazy appearance, in its turn, will give place quite suddenly to a blindness of the senses to all else but a blue or bluish ocean of space, against which, as if it were a background, the vision will be clearly apparent. 6. The crystal should not be used soon after taking a meal, and care should be taken in matters of diet to partake only of digestible foods, and to avoid alcoholic beverages. Plain and nourishing food, and outdoor exercise, with contentment of mind, or love of simplicity in living, are great aids to success. Mental anxiety or ill health are not conducive to the desired end. Attention to correct breathing is of importance. 7. As regards the time at which events seen will come to pass, each seer is usually impressed with regard thereto but, as a general rule, visions appearing in the extreme background indicate time more remote, either past or future, than those perceived nearer at hand, while those appearing in the foreground or closer to the seer denote the present or immediate future. Eight two principal classes of vision will present themselves to the sitter, of the symbolic, indicated by the appearance of symbols, such as a flag, boat, knife, gold, etc., and b actual scenes and personages, in action or otherwise. The more active, excitable, yet decided type are most likely to perceive symbolically or allegorically while those of a passive nature usually receive direct or literal revelations. 
Both classes will find it necessary to carefully cultivate truthfulness, unselfishness, gratitude for what is shown, and absolute confidence in the love, wisdom, and guidance of God Himself. As the student proceeds with the study of these lessons, he will become acquainted with various details and methods concerned with the various phases of clairvoyance, which knowledge he may then combine with the Imatsai, the whole aiding him in the successful manifestation of the psychic phenomena of crystal gazing, which, as I have said, is merely one phase of clairvoyance and under the same general laws and rules of manifestation. Remember that present, past, and future clairvoyance all is possible to the highly developed crystal gazer. The astral tube, closely allied with the phenomena of crystal gazing and that of psychometry, is that which occultists know as the astral tube. Although this psychic channel may be developed in ordinary clairvoyance by means of the power of concentrated attention, etc., I shall not enter into a detailed or technical discussion of the astral tube, but I wish to give you a general and comprehensive view of it and its workings. In case of the strong concentration of the mind, in cases of psychometry or crystal gazing, a channel or line of force is set up in the astral substance which composes the basis of the astral plensids. This is like the wake of a ship made on the surface of the water through which the ship has passed, or it is like a current of magnetic force in the ether. It is caused by a polarization of the particles composing the astral substance, which manifest in a current of intense vibrations in the astral substance, which thus serve as a ready channel for the transmission of the psychic force or astral energy. The astral tube serves as a ready conductor of the vibrations, currents, and waves of energy on the astral plane which carry to the astral senses of the person the perception of the things, objects and scenes far removed from him in space and time. How these things far removed in space and time are perceived by the astral seers explained in subsequent lessons of this course. At this place we are concerned merely with the channel through which the currents of energy flow, and which has been called the astral tube. As a writer well says through the astral tube the astral senses actually sense the sights, and often the sounds, being manifested at a distance, just as one may see distant sights when the east in sights and sights the cope, or hear distant sounds through a telephone. The astral tube is used in a variety of forms of psychic phenomena. It is often used unconsciously, and springs into existence spontaneously, under the strong influence of a vivid emotion, desire or will. It is used by the trained psychometrist, without the use of any starting point of focal center simply by the use of his trained, developed and concentrated will. But its most familiar and common use is in connection with some object serving as a starting point or subobject focal center. The starting point or focal center, the starting point or focal center, above mentioned, is generally either what is known as the associated object in the class of phenomena generally known as psychometry, or else a glass or crystal ball, or similar polished surface in what is known as crystal gazing. Another authority tells his readers that astral sight, when it is cramped by being directed along what is practically a tube, is limited very much as physical sight would be under similar circumstances, though if possessed in perfection it will continue to show even at that distance the even soras, and therefore all the emotions and most of the thoughts of the people under observation. But it may be said, the mere fact that he is using astral sight ought to enable him to see things from all sides at once, and so it would, if he were using that sight in a normal way upon an object which was fairly near him, within his astral reach, as it were but at a distance of hundreds or thousands of miles the case is very different. Astral sight gives us the advantage of an additional dimension, but there is still such a thing as position in that dimension and it is naturally a potent factor in limiting the use of the powers on that plane. The limitations resemble those of a man using a telescope on the physical plane. The experimenter, for example, has a particular field of view which cannot be enlarged or altered he is looking at his scene from a certain direction, and he cannot suddenly turn it all around and see how it looks from the other side. If he has sufficient psychic energy to spare, he may drop altogether the telescope he is using, and manufacture an entirely new one for himself which will approach his objective somewhat differently, but this is not a course at all likely to piss a car. The student will find that, as we progress, many of these points which now seem complicated and obscure will gradually take on the aspect of simplicity and clearness. We must crawl before we can walk, in psychic research as well as in shin everything else. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video. What are your thoughts on the power of crystal gazing and its connection to the astral plane? Have you ever experienced visions through it, or do you plan to give it a try? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next lesson, where we explore Clairvoyant Reverie, a fascinating method of entering the astral plane through psychic states. Stay tuned for more insights into the mysteries of the mind.